All right, good morning, everyone. I know we've got some more folks that will be joining us, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for the second session in our four-part series focusing on transaction service basics for business owners. It's hosted by the Michigan Manufacturers Association and the closely held business experts at Clayton and McCurvey. Today, we'll be talking about the art of the deal and how you can put the right team in place when you're seriously considering a transaction. My name is Delaney McKinley, and I'm Vice President of Membership Marketing and Events for the MMA. MMA is the premier advocate and solutions provider for Michigan's manufacturing community. We're working every day in Lansing to secure a prosperous future for, for Michigan manufacturers. We do that through effective advocacy at the state capitol, meaningful education like this webinar, and strategic business services. We represent nearly 1,700 members ranging from small mom and pop shops to the world's largest and most iconic corporations. Facilitating today's discussion will be Jim Beal. He's a shareholder with Clayton and McCurvey and the firm's leader in their manufacturing and distribution team. Jim manages a portfolio of closely held businesses. He provides guidance on tax, finance, operational, and accounting issues that impact his client's bottom line. He's known for his energetic approach, so I know this morning's discussion is going to be really fun and engaging. Now, before we get rolling, I've got a couple housekeeping items to cover. We hope that today's discussion will be interactive. So please feel free to use the Q&A function to share your thoughts and questions for Jim and our panelists today. Um, so if you, if you hover your mouse toward the bottom of your screen, there should be a button that you can click on uh, to open a Q&A screen. Uh, if you're having any technical issues, you can enter them in the chat function, which is also found in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and after today's session, we will be sending you a recording of the discussion as well as the slides. So watch your inbox for that within the next 24 hours. Uh, now, we uh, have an absolutely fantastic panel of professionals participating in what we really hope to be a dynamic and engaging discussion this morning. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Thanks, Delaney. I'm going to share my desktop if you're going to be off. Let's see what we go here. It works. Everyone can see my desktop, hopefully. Can see it. Looks great. All right, good. Uh, Welcome to the Art of the Deal. As uh, Delaney had mentioned, my name is Jim Beal. I'm a shareholder at Clayton and McCurvey. I head up our manufacturing and distribution group. And uh, I have a client base of around 40 clients, uh, most of them manufacturing clients that I deal with. The series that we're putting on, as Delaney had mentioned, is uh, based on the, if my screen works here, is based on a, uh, what's happening in our practice. And I guess in the market in general. We're seeing quite a spike in the M&A uh, uh, activity, uh, whether it is because of boomers that are getting to a certain age where they're looking to, to uh, transfer the ownership of the business, whether it's a fair amount of COVID fatigue that's occurring where people are, are just ready to get out from the business. Uh, one thing that we have seen though, is we've gone across all of the different uh, spike in activity is a lack of, uh, uh, knowledge uh, or a, a need to get more knowledge to the owner base as to the ability to plan for the transaction and work through the transaction. So we put together this four-part series. The first part was done back uh, two weeks ago. Tim Hilligus, one of our expert panelists for today's session, did a fantastic job on that. If you did not attend the one on May 6th, please go to the MMA website or the Clayton McCruby website. It is taped. It's a great overview from uh, planning all the way through close of the transaction, give you a good insight on uh, what you might be looking at. As I mentioned, today is the art of the deal, which is we've got uh, three expert uh, panelists that are uh, experts on M&A that we're going to fire questions at. It's going to be a facilitated discussion. But again, like Delaney had mentioned, uh, hit the Q&A button. This is uh, your session. So if you've got some questions you want to fire at these three, three experts, by all means, do that. Uh, the third session, mark your calendar, June 10th, is going to be on due diligence. It's all about the due diligence, I guess, is the official title, but it's going to dig into a little bit more into the diligence process once you're into a transaction. Uh, the fourth session is uh, post-closing, now what? You know, you've had this illiquid asset, your, your business that now is liquid. It changes the game. You're going to have to learn a little bit about how you adjust for that. And we're going to do a session on the 24th of June. So again, by all means, mark your calendars. Takeaways, what we hope to get to you today based upon the questions and the round table with our experts is information again to help you uh, relative to who are the members of an advisory team, what are the roles, 
how to assemble a team, the interplay against these uh, members of the advisory team, the benefits of assembling the proper team. And I, I can tell you it's critical to get the right players with the right expertise in place because it can add significant value to the transaction. And then the cost, the general framework for the cost of uh, hiring a team. Advisory team members, uh, generally what you will see in a, in a transaction planning all the way through completion would be the accountant, the attorney, the investment banker. Those are the three that are represented on our expert panel today. Uh, your, your banker for your business, your normal banker, your internal management, uh, A to Z is relative to the owner all the way through CFO, HR is involved. If you have an external board, they might be involved as well. It's a couple that I probably left off of here that I should have put on. One was a financial planner. When you get to that stage four, the liquid state, you usually need somebody to help you out. It's a little different animal. You're not getting salary or dividend distributions. You're getting investment returns. So you need that uh, financial advisor from that standpoint. And then probably the last is a valuation expert if you're just doing gifts. If you're doing gifting and you need somebody to assign values that you're going through the gifting process. Our panelists, and I will stop sharing my desktop so you can see them live. How's that? Let me make the introductions. Our panelists, our expert M&A panelists, we're going to start with our accountant, Tim Hillegas. Tim is a partner of mine at Clayton and McCurvey, where he manages a portfolio of closely held businesses. He also consults with business owners on transactions and helps them tackle the top financial tax and operational issues impacting their bottom line. I've had that opportunity to work with Tim on a number of client engagements over the last couple of years. He consistently adds value, and I'm glad that uh, Tim is on the panel today. Thanks, Tim. Second is investment banker Bob Corey. Bob is the CEO and managing director of Greenwich Capital Group, which is focused on mergers and acquisitions, financial analytics, business strategy, and capital advisory. He is an expert he has expertise across a wide range of industries, including manufacturing, consumer products, business services, and technology. Welcome, Bob. Last but not least, our attorney is Jim Wagoner. Jim is an attorney at Clark Hill, specializing in corporate structure, governance, mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, and general commercial transactions. He guides clients through the entire transaction process while assisting them in evaluating and understanding the middle, many legal issues presented. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Expert panelists, I'm going to start out with a little bit of a lob to the three of you. I'm going to start uh, with a question that asking you to explain your role in the transaction team, including specific functions in a typical engagement. I'm going to start with Bob, and then we're going to go to Jim and Tim, if we can go in that order. Bob, if you can take it away. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. and it, um, I think it's the easiest way to explain all of our roles, but our my role in particular is a typical engagement that I'm involved in, and I hate to say typical because every deal is so, so different, but a typical engagement is a private business owner. It could be a family owned business through generations who've, who've grown a wonderful company and they are prepared to sell a business and they've never gone through a sale. On the other side of the equation though, is the potential buyers. There could be 20, 30, 50, 100 strategic companies that operate in their sector who are, who have acquired a lot of companies, know what they're doing, have, have professionals engaged, ready to go, and they're all over the globe. You have private equity firms. And right now, when I say there's thousands of private equity firms who are looking for deals, they're salivating for deals, that is not an understatement. They're loaded with $1.5 trillion of capital waiting to be spent. And they are sophisticated buyers. And then the third category that I highlight is family offices, which are wealthy individuals who have established family offices who are looking to invest their money into the into private businesses. Again, sophisticated buyers on the, on the right side and hundreds of them that would probably be very interested in your company. And in between, we have to bridge that gap. We have to take what I would consider a David and Goliath story of sophistication on M&A and transactions and even the playing field or even put it in your favor. And our role is to market your business, prepare market, and then run a process with all of those potential buyers after you approve us approaching the market, of course, and, and, and run the process so it minimizes the disruption for your business and maximizes the value and finds you the right partner that you want for your, for your business when it's time to sell. 
Thanks, Bob. Jim? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the, the role of legal counsel, um, you know, we, we probably wear a couple of different hats during the transaction process. Uh, certainly, uh, our, our initial role is to, is to uh, guide the seller in terms of preparing uh, for the transaction, making sure that uh, their, their corporate structure, their corporate documents are all in order, uh, making sure that we're, we're collecting uh, data that, that potential buyers are going to want to see, that we're reviewing uh, those documents, understanding what might be necessary to do in advance of the transaction or, or what might be required in connection with the transaction. Uh, and then certainly, uh, what I would call our, our primary role is, is documenting and negotiating the operative transaction documents, uh, whether it's something as simple as, as, as crafting a confidentiality agreement for when the, the business goes to market, uh, to drafting, negotiating a letter of intent, and then certainly the, the transaction documents, whether it be an asset uh, purchase agreement, a stock purchase agreement, uh, and certainly any ancillary documents that, that are necessary as part of the transaction, employment agreements, transition services agreements. Uh, and then, of course, depending on, on the, the law firm or the legal counsel that you're using, making sure that we're providing subject matter experts, right? So uh, when you're working on these types of transactions, there's, off, there's often quite a few components that come into play. It's not just the corporate attorneys that are involved. We've got environmental concerns real property concerns, labor and employment, antitrust. And, and, and so what we can do is we can provide the, the legal experts uh, it, within each of those, those industries to make sure that we're providing uh, the, the, the guidance that is necessary uh, throughout the entirety of the process. Tim? Thanks, Jim. Um, you know, uh, similar to, to Jim, what, what Jim Wagner described, you get to wear a lot of hats. Um, from an accounting side, we can be representing a, a buyer or a seller. So we might have buy side due diligence, sell side assistance. One of the first roles or responsibilities I always feel is, is making sure, and, and we're going to talk a little bit, of, you, you put a slide up about the team, but it's making sure that the right people are there to help our client, whether that's an introduction to Bob or an introduction to Jim, making sure that that experience is there. On the specifics of, for example, a, a buy side transaction, we're typically working with a client uh, that might have been introduced to an opportunity from Bob. We're going to review the financial information. We're going to provide credibility or, or you know, deal with the skepticism of information that comes in and kind of justify the financial information and help a client understand um, the, the financial aspect of a transaction. We'll typically get involved in analyzing the, the things you're buying, the networking capital, and understanding how you can value those within a transaction. Um, the definitions, you know, uh, we rely on people like Jim Wagoner to put together the purchase agreement, but very often the accountants are involved in defining debt with respect to how it's termed in the, the particular parties, uh, identifying the tax um, reps and warranties or issues that might be there, maybe establishing escrow, assessing risk associated with receivables or inventory and things like that. So we, we tend to wear a lot of different hats and get involved on the sell side. It's typically much more front-loaded. We're helping companies like Bob understand the company's quality of earnings, what's their true cash flow, so there aren't any surprises when they are delivering a package out to potential buyers. You're trying to mitigate that and make sure buyers know what they're getting. On the sell side, it might be helping a, a seller understand the nuances between an asset transaction or a stock transaction, um, the tax aspects of that, and then, again, digesting the purchase agreement and understanding the nuances and how the purchase agreement could affect our client who might be selling their company. Um, and probably the, the, the one thing that comes out, and Jim, can, Jim Beal can attest to this, but probably the first question we often get from a client is, what will my after-tax cash flow be? So we, we do spend a lot of time analyzing you know, what is the, whether, again, an asset or a stock sale, what's the after uh, debts paid, cash is received after taxes. What's my after tax cash flow, net cash flow? Thanks, Tim. Is it critical, Bob, for the team members to have industry experience in this situation? Yeah, it clearly helps. Um, some industries are so, uh, maybe the smaller industries don't have 
bankers or lawyers with expertise or accountants with expertise maybe, but most do. And I would say it's critical. And when you're talking about here, the manufacturing world, some things that are clear in almost every deal we work on, uh, you're going to have a, a pretty significant view and look at inventory. You're gonna have a significant view of CapEx and where are you in a CapEx structure and how it impacts value. You're gonna have an environmental you know, concern oftentimes with a manufacturing facility that you have to work your way through. There are just so many um, specifics on manufacturing that you've had to work through in the past to really be skilled at, at managing. Additionally, I think you also need to understand who the buyers are, who's really a buyer, who kicks the tires and kind of moves on versus who's really buying and acquiring. You need to understand how they've reacted in prior transactions. So they might've signed an LOI with a company and retraded that deal multiple times once they got exclusivity. All of this insight into the potential buyer world is gonna be critical in understanding how to, how to process a deal and, and obtain the highest value, find the right buyer, and assure that you have a closing once you start the process. Um, so these are all some unique characteristics. And I would advise if they're, the industry skill set is, is important. Jim, M&A experience, is that critical for the team members to have uh, M&A background? At, well, and certainly I'm partial, but, but I think it's, it's crucial. Uh, you know, Bob and his team are certainly going to do what they can to drive the value, right? That there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of us as attorneys are going to do that's going to increase perhaps the purchase price. Our job, on the other hand, is to protect the value that our sellers receive. And, and there's a number of ways to do that. And there's a, there's a lot of nuance to doing these types of transactions to make sure that we're building in those protections uh, through negotiating, you know, reps and warranties, indemnities, baskets and caps, uh, ma making sure that, that we're putting a fence around the, the risk and liability of the seller uh, so that, you know, going forward, they're not having to look over their shoulder or be, or be concerned that there could be a potential claim on a post-closing basis. Uh, I, I've done a number of transactions where, you know, opposing counsel was, was not well-versed in the M&A process. Uh, and I can tell you that, that for the most part, those transactions take a lot longer and, and can be more costly because there's, part, there's, there's an educating process and, and there just isn't that understanding of the various concepts and nuances uh, that go into these types of transactions, which can be very complicated. Yeah, I, I would add, I would add that with my experience, when you have a, a buyer on the other side and they see that the, the seller has an, an attorney who does not have M&A experience or isn't maybe to the same caliber as they are, they, own, they get disappointed. They know it's going to be a harder transaction. They know they're going to have to explain the deal to the other side. I, I think it's critical. And I think, you know, I'm going to tell Jim's horn a little bit. I think one of the most critical parts of this that I often see in, in my experience is when business owners want to use their attorney and their attorney doesn't have M&A experience, I, I, we work hard to talk them out of that decision-making. It is a impediment to a really high-end successful transaction oftentimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna agree. I just wanna chime in real quick, Jim. I can't say enough about what Jim, Jim and Bob have said, where, where, where Jim's experience or your attorney's experience comes in is those buckets, those escrows, um, the reps and warranties. When, when somebody, when a buyer is putting, legal team is putting together that purchase agreement, guess who, guess who they're structuring that purchase agreement for? For themselves. And so having an attorney who can say, I've never seen this before, or this is not typical, and you fight back on those things because there, there's, there's, you know, there's battlegrounds in every section in a purchase agreement. And so having someone with experience who can say, no, that's probably not good for us is really important versus what Bob described, the attorney who just goes, well, it, it, it looks right, looks good, you know, um, and, and we probably have all seen that where we've stepped into a transaction where one side or the other maybe didn't have that experience. If I understand it correctly, Jim, is it, I guess the way Jim placed it was, Bob tees it up. He's gone out. He's gone to the market. They've assigned a value. They selected a buyer. Now it's the concern that you're going to lose that value through the documentation process, the, the transaction process, because there's hidden, there's hidden traps. And if you don't know where those hidden traps are, uh, if you're not well versed in it, you're not going to know what to look for that could cause you a 
decrease in that value when you get to close. Is that a correct statement, Jim? Is yeah, I think that's right. I, I mean, I you know, oftentimes uh, w when we receive offers from from potential buyers, they're they're certainly putting their best foot forward uh, because they want to come across as attractive to the seller and, and they want to secure the deal. Uh, once then you get past the LOI stage and you start negotiating the operative documents. And certainly the buyer team is conducting its due diligence. They're looking for ways perhaps to, to chop down that price a bit, or they're looking for ways to build in better protections uh, uh, to make sure that they're maximizing their value. So, so certainly as sell side counsel, we want to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, to maintain uh, the value of that offer and, and, and to certainly protect sellers uh, on a post-closing basis so that they get to enjoy the benefits of the business they've built and the value they received for that business. Transaction advisors, Tim, do they need to know each other? Do they have to have worked on a number of transactions to be efficient? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think like anything else, familiarity might bring some comfort and some understanding of how people function. You know, if Jim and I have worked together, um, I think I know where, where my role on the tax side of a transaction. By the way, Jim and I have been on both sides of a table um, where he represented a, a buyer and we've been on the side uh, and my client was the seller. And, and right now we're about to get involved in one where we're both on the buyer side. We're both representing the same client. So um, that familiarity is comfortable, but I would say going back to your, your, your last comment, uh, the, the experience of the professionals is much more important. You know, I think I'm going to get a real quick sense of Bob and Jim's capabilities very quickly into the, into the process, whether I've worked with them or not. You know, so so I think experience trumps familiarity. I'm going to come right back at you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll say I, I would agree, and I would say that what I find critical is 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 finding people who want who understand that this is a team pursuit and a team activity. And it, I, I, it sounds so cliche, but if 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 I didn't respect what Tim was going to do and his what he needs to do to protect a client and what Jim was going to do. And I don't bring them in and, and articulate and communicate effectively. I'm not doing my job. And so it is people who really understand and embrace the team atmosphere of getting a deal done and the process done correctly. That as long as they're, they're the right caliber of practitioner, I, I would agree exactly what Tim said. It's it's nice, but it's not an absolute. I'm going to go back to Tim Hilligus on this one, um, and, and a little bit as to give me why relative. I have a CPA. Why can't I use them? Specifics as to what do you bring to the table if you're an experienced M&A accountant versus just the, the guy that does the tax return in the financial state? Well, I, I, to me, I mean, I could tell examples of success and examples of failure within transactions where um, either I saw it on my side or on the other side where that experience brought value. Um, we just had a transaction closed about a month ago where very near the end, the definition of debt changed and what, uh, what a buyer was put, what a buyer wanted to put into the definition of debt and not to get too uh, entrenched in the details, but it was as if they just lowered the purchase price 1.6 million. And, you know, our thoroughness of, of having gone through the, the way we presented the network and capital, the way we defined debt and all the information that the buyer received uh, the original drafts of the purchase agreement, the letters of intent, you know, you bring all that together and say, you know what, I got to dig my heels in here. So I, I think that um, the, the value of the accountant skills and, and whatever firm somebody's with, you got to find that team that's worked in that area. Now, I still call on my tax experts for many different areas of this. So I, I hope I'm answering your question, but I think the experience of that CPA can add value it sure, certainly shouldn't be standalone. I mean, I can, I, I'm sure all three of us can tell you experiences where there was either a bad attorney, not bad, but let, let's say an inexperienced attorney, inexperienced accountant, or maybe not even an investment banker. And you went, wow, in hindsight, this would have been better. This might be one for you and Bob, because I, my understanding is a lot of clients will get tapped on the shoulder and start to cycle information out to the prospective person that might be buying them. Uh, usually raw information. Is that something that the investment banker or the accountant, uh, who, who does the, the, what they call the quality of earnings to try to purify, get 
good information out to someone that's trying to assess a value to the company? I'll, I'll leave that up to you and Bob, maybe to answer that. Well, I, I think it's like a two-step process. First, if somebody decides they're looking to possibly sell their business, um, they have to understand the differences of what Bob brings to the table and being able to market a business nationally or globally. Um, that's completely different than looking at your peer network or who's in your neighborhood. Uh, I think there's tremendous value from that. Um, but the other aspect, the aspect you're talking about specifically is Bob's got to be able to understand what, it, what is the true value of this enterprise, whether his organization prepares their own uh, has their own methodology to do quality of earnings or we're performing it for our specific, for our clients. And, and a lot of times when our clients are giving us a heads up, we start that process very early on because you'd be, I'm presuming that most of the companies on this webinar are closely held businesses. And there are so many different nuances, whether it's uh, perks for yourself with clubs and country clubs, uh, salaries, uh, vacation. Uh, uh, there, there are just so many nuances within a privately held business that needs to be identified to, uh, for somebody like Bob to be able to see the true value of a business. This, this isn't just applicable for private businesses either. I mean, I, I, I would tell a little bit of a story here, but um, like about 15, 20 years ago, there was an OE automotive, automotive company in town who was divesting a number of assets, maybe it was 20 years ago, um, and after a few of these divestitures, they realized that these buyers were able to take the company they were divesting in and do so many things to create so much value within one year. I was sitting in the CFO's office and he said to me, I am tired of having a buyer know more about my business than I know about my business. And this is exactly what Tim is addressing, that we are not going to, we're, we are not going to approach a market and not know the business better than they know the business. So we're gonna prepare. We're going to make sure we understand every, every problem, every benefit, every value driver. And we're gonna present them appropriately. And we're, when they bring in their experts down the road and wanna beat us up, we're, we've already, we already understand this, we know it. So we're not surprised in the transaction. And this is where, again, every one of us on this call needs to be part of being, making sure we aren't surprised in the transaction by preparing before we go to market. And, yeah. We do. And Jim, to your specific question, I think if some of the listeners out there have their, their 30 year CPA that they've been happy with, you know, there may be a sistering or a partnership that works where you realize, you know, he, I've never heard him talk about transactions he's working on. I've never, you know, uh, never known that to be a part of his practice. I mean, it, it may be worth discussing or identifying. You got that long-term relationship. Ask, ask your, your, your current advisor, you know, should we should we uh, get some additional help on something like this? this is probably the most important thing entrepreneurs do. And you mentioned early on, you know, you're very, you're, 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 all your wealth is held in this one asset. There's no liquidity. It's all right there. And you, you really need to have the approach of how do I get the most out of this possible? And revisiting your, your current uh, team is, is be an important, important component to maximizing that value. Jim, one for you here. Uh, same question. Uh, I think we've touched on it a little bit, but I've got an attorney. Why can't I use them? Uh, I, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, well, again, I think it's it's crucial to have an attorney that's got experience in doing M and A transactions. Um, there's there's a lot of a lot of attorneys out there, and um, in a lot of different practice areas. And it, and and I can tell you, just having focused on on mainly corporate and M and A transactions my entire 15 career, I, I can't imagine having to learn multiple other you know facets of the law, whether it's environmental or labor and employment, because there's no way I could specialize in all of those. And and a lot of attorneys will hold themselves out as being specialized in multiple areas of the law, and it just doesn't always translate that way. Um, so, so I think you have to have someone who's been through the process, who understands the different components of an M and A deal, uh, and certainly the nuances of of uh, of the transaction. Uh, there, there's a lot of concepts uh, in a purchase agreement, which if you don't have that experience, you're certainly not providing value to your client. Uh, you have to understand, especially when sophisticated counsel is on the other side. Uh, you're going to get a sophisticated document, and you have to be able to read and understand. Uh, what each of those provisions mean. And you have to be able to provide 
subject matter experts, uh, you know, when it's outside of your, your, your uh, perhaps focus uh, of law to, to bring those people in to make sure that they can, they can provide the guidance that your client needs. So, so I think, again, ha having that experience and going through that process over and over again uh, is certainly useful. Thank you. We actually had an audience member that threw a question out, so we're going to take a quick break and answer that question. They're saying, is there a trend right now of more or less businesses going for sales because of the environment? I think I touched on it a little bit. COVID fatigue, baby boomer generation retiring, tax hikes. Is the tax hikes driving it? Or is that some of the spike that people are concerned about? What are thoughts from the three of you on that, on that topic? Well, certainly from my perspective, uh, my M&A practice, I'm not sure I've been busier, um, geez, maybe in my entire career. Uh, we've got multiple transactions going on right now. Um, and, and I think a lot of it, and I'm sure Bob can speak to this, is just the amount of money that's sitting out there, uh, especially on the private equity sector. Uh, I, I think there was obvious concerns when we were in the midst of the pandemic and, and a lot of deals were, were put to the side at that time. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've seen now uh, that we're, we're coming out of that and, and people are re-engaging in the process. Uh, certainly the, the concern regarding uh, an increase in capital gains, I think that's going to push uh, the, the M&A market, uh, especially as we get, you know, through this year. Uh, so I think that's going to, to certainly increase our, our deal activity. But yes, I, I mean, I, I've certainly seen uh, a, a large uptick in, in M&A transactions. Robert, Tim, any additional yeah, thoughts? No, I, I would agree. Um, I, I would. I would also say it's been a little bit choppy. There's some. There's some um, businesses right now that are still dealing with maybe a downturn from COVID. That they're trying to. They're trying to get past the 12 months. Of a explanation around the COVID hit. There's some other things that are going on, but ultimately, right now, deal flow is much different than it was. It's very high. I would, from the other side of the equation, if you're showing up with a quality asset right now. The buyer's market is unbelievable how much they're willing to pay and throw money at deals. I mean, it is, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm, I, I am just kind of stunned right now that we're coming out of a pandemic and the economic downturn we had and multiples and money is being, um, I hate to say thrown at companies, but it is, it is at a very high level of interest in multiples. And uh, so if you're a quality company and you're considering selling for all the reasons, including tax, and you will be met with a lot of buyers with a lot of money very interested in buying you. And uh, that's almost an absolute. I don't, I don't think I could add anything more than what, uh, what Bob and Jim said, other than I, I do think there's a bit of a baby boomer. I mean, if I look at the last three or four transactions in our office, the, these are guys who I think are, uh, are excited about what they built and to corroborate what Bob just said are shocked at what the value is. And when that phone rang, um, they, they picked it up. And so I think it, it's a combination of few of those, but I, I think uh, um, I've only had a few where the COVID fatigue really kicked in and it, it's smaller businesses where they're having trouble hiring, where they're going, I really don't want to deal with this headache again. So. Yeah. One of the follow-up questions from the audience, they're asking, what are the multiples going for in a manufacturing company? It Bob, depends. Or, or Tim, yeah, whoever's <laughs> out there. It depends. Yeah, I, I mean, I could throw a range out there, but th this to me is one of the biggest problems with water cooler talk or golf course talk that really throws people for a loop because you never know the, the person you talk to, did they have a management concentration, a customer concentration? Um, there are so many nuances that uh, is there EBITDA in a, in a level where the multiples are higher? Are they down here using a broker? Uh, I, 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 would, I would say that right now, to use Bob's term, money right now is available and, and you may never see this much value um, than you do right now. Yeah, is there, I, I, I would add, you know, probably you know, we're one to two turns stronger today, maybe in, in multiples than we were three, four years ago. Um, for manuf and Tim's absolutely right. I, I couldn't even, there's so many things that go into deciding what a value of the company is, cap, you know, what's your CapEx requirements every year and working capital requirements and what is your growth rate and profitability and, and how sustainable is your, is your profitability? That's a big part of it. If you're 
if you have a secure business with a, a moat around it and you can grow it, the multiples are going to be high. And what that means, I mean, I, if I had to put numbers around it, I'd say majority of manufacturing companies probably trade between five and 10, but that's a wide range. And again, I've seen them outside of those ranges as well, but um, there's, there's factors that we can almost tell you up front. I think a lot of us can tell you up front, we spend time on it, where we think you'd fall in that range but they are higher today than they were. That's probably the critical part of it. Well, that probably leads in, Raul. I'm gonna throw this one at Jim and Tim. Do we need to hire an investment banker? You know, you get the tap on the shoulder and you've got a friendly or a PE showing up at the door. I already got a buyer. Why, why do I need to hire an investment banker? Maybe you two can touch on that. Yeah, I, I certainly think that any seller serious about, about going to market and, and engaging in a sale process has to take a hard look at, at bringing on an investment banker. Um, you know, as, as Bob, I think, said in his, his opening remarks, um, the, the connections and resources that investment banking firms have uh, really can, can provide to a seller such an expansive buyer pool, um, so much greater than, than I think any seller could probably, you know, get to on its own. Um, most of these guys have been doing it for years and years and years and have, have tons of, of industry experience and knowledge uh, and have developed contacts over the years that they can lean on. Uh, and, and again, by doing that, you're really helping drive the value up and up and up. Um, you know, so many times when, when we're engaged in this process and we've got an investment banker, we see anywhere from, you know, two, three, four, five uh, interested parties that, you know, in some cases end up negotiating against themselves and that drives that price up, uh, which, you know, obviously for a seller is, is very beneficial. Uh, and then certainly I think, especially on the front end, just the, the, uh, the burden they can lift off a seller in terms of preparation for a transaction. Um, you know, most, most sellers don't realize or understand what's involved in the process and just how burdensome, it can be, um, you know, you're still trying to operate a business while you're going through this process. And, and believe me, it's, it's taxing. Uh, and so when you've got an investment banker on your team and, and you can lean on their resources, they can take such, uh, so much of that burden off of the seller and its management team, uh, which I think is just tremendously valuable. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Jim said. A couple of things I would add, um, they don't bring emotion. You know, a buyer, a seller trying to sell his own business, they get deal fatigued, they get tired, um, their emotions play a role in it. And what, what the investment banker brings is the normalization of every deal and every experience they've had. Hey, this is not normal. We don't like uh, a buyer talking to our seller because they try to get answers right then and there. And we need time to think about questions and you know, an investment banker gets that ability to say, you know what, let, let us digest that. Um, but one of the biggest things that's really come about for, in my practice in the last year is the competition aspect. So I'll give an example. Uh, a client says, you know what, one of my peers wants to buy me. They want to get in this region of the country. Um, offer, here's the offer. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to sell. And you say, okay, well, would you like we probably should put a team together. I'd like you to interview some investment bankers. Maybe they interview them, maybe they don't. But all of a sudden it's, you know what? I think we can handle this. And, and inevitably what happens when that buyer knows you're not marketing your business, they don't stop asking for concessions or things because they know it's not competitive. And I think having that competition is a very, very powerful trump card to, I think, we, I think we've given enough. And I've been through enough transactions where, where the asking goes all the way right, right till 1159 the night before closing. They won't stop asking for uh, an adjustment to the network and capital peg, something to find as debt. Maybe there's a customer deposit account you've been arguing about. And what an investment banker brings to the table is if this isn't the right deal, that's okay. You know, <laughs> we, we've got competition. I think competition um, creates to me security for a seller, for sure. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's not often discussed that security of, I, I know that by marketing this nationally or getting more competition in there, I have a much greater chance of getting the best price I possibly can before I get tired because they're going to get tired. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, the other thing I, I guess I would add to that is, is you know, an investment banker is going to be able to sit down and, and go through the financials with a buy with a seller. I'm sorry, and and you know, say to them, hey, you know, maybe you ought to wait another 12 months. You know, we, we you've got a strong pipeline. Maybe maybe you need to wait a little bit longer. Or or here's some other alternatives you can think of rather than perhaps selling off the entirety of the company. So I think from a preparation perspective, uh, they, they can certainly add a lot of insight, especially up front, uh, to 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 guide the to guide the seller on, on the correct path. Bob, I let the two of them speak to your your area. Any any final thoughts you want to throw in on there? I, I would just add to what Jim said, and, and you know, first you know, we'll talk about how investment bankers are paid, and it's usually contingent on a deal getting done. But um, what's important here is that you it, I mean, you truly have an advisor as an investment banker who is, and and I had this beaten into my head over a thirty year career, and and I believe this that I cannot be a transactional guy. I need to be an advisor, and so sometimes. It is my is my responsibility to tell a client I wouldn't sell now or I wouldn't sell for this price. I would wait. I would do something different, even if it impacts my potential for a fee. I I need to be able to advise a client, and I have done that, and I know we will. It's just it, it isn't always the right time to sell, and sometimes you have to we have to you have to say some hard decisions to a client, and. Um, and make sure that they're positioned right. And it might be three years from now, or it might be doing something different as I think Tim said, it might be some alternative structures. It, it just, we need to understand what their objectives are and match those objectives. And it's not always the right answer to sell today. So. And, you know, one of the unique things right now is with COVID, Bob's going to have more experience with transactions on how did growth from COVID how is that being handled by potential buyers? Just the same as how is dips from COVID potentially. So, you know, you, if you don't have somebody with that experience, you're kind of winging it on your own. And I've seen it both ways. I've got clients who are having record gross margins right now, record sales, but I've got a few where a few of their industries dropped completely off. You know, we'll call it compression. Right now it's deferred. It's going to get shifted down the pike, but Having that experience to know, well, how how would how are most buyers managing this either uptick or downtick from COVID? And, and having somebody who's seen, you know, 20 of those versus none of those is going to be valuable. Bob, one of the questions from the audience, a follow-up question, and I, I think if I'm reading it correctly, he's basically saying with the flurry of acquisitions occurring right now uh, and the money thrown at the deals, if you say, wait, is the deal going to be there two or three years from now? Is it, is, I guess if I'm getting the gist of the question. Yeah, and that's fair. I wouldn't say wait if I didn't think the deal would be there three or four years from now, but there are some companies who aren't ready to be sold today. And I, and I, I can give you a whole list of reasons. Um, you know, potentially they don't have a, you know, they, what I often see and we all see is a business owner wants to sell. They want to walk away after the sale and they have no one behind them to actually run the business. And we got to make sure they're prepared to run the business after the fact. That's just one of many reasons. But again, I, I, more than likely in this market, if you want to sell and you're a quality company and you're prepared, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, let's, it's game on. Let's get it and let's maximize value. It's a rare situation where, it's not rare, it just happens, but it's, you know, it's not like a majority of the time, but it happens where you, you want them to hold because you don't think they can maximize value today. If you understand the industry, which we talked about already, and you know where the industry is going, and you know they can position themselves better two years from now, yeah, it might be worth waiting. And I'm I'm ignoring your tax issues and anything else. I'm just saying in general. So, yeah. if that makes sense. What is the difference, Bob, between uh, an investment banker and a business broker? You hear the term business broker. Is that the same thing? It's different. And let me let me just say, even for an investment banker. There's a difference in investment bankers. If you, you know, you've all heard of Bal you know, Goldman Sachs and the you know, bulge bracket investment bankers, the ones in Wall Street, they're typically working you know, public company deals or $500 million deals and up. Then you have bankers who work maybe $300 million to $500 million. You know, our, our firm works on deals typically between $15 million and $200 million. A business broker tends to work you know, the, the sub maybe $10 million valuation where investment bankers don't play. And part of it is because it's hard. It's, it's, it's a very difficult place to play and get paid for your effort. And I hate to say that, but it's, you got six or seven months of hard work to get a deal done. 
and there's a fee structure. And if you can't create enough value for your client or paying you the fee, it doesn't make sense. So we, we tend not to dip down. That's where business brokers come into play. They tend to work in the sub 10 to $15 million market. It's a little different approach. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, degrade a business broker. I think they do a great jobs of what they're doing, but it's not as intense of, of, of an effort in, in how they approach the markets less intense um, and how they handle a client, manage clients less intense. The analytics, the preparation, the approach, I think is a little less intensity, but it matches the size of the deal. Yeah, I, and, and I, just, to, just to piggyback on Bob, very often small businesses are, are really relegated to have to deal with some of these brokers, but what, what they have to do well is they ha- they, they're marketers. You know, they are sending out your data the best they can out to a network. It could be a strategic buyer who's adding it on. It could be an executive at a company who now wants to own his own business. You know, he uses 401k money, try to get an SBA loan. But that lower tier of businesses, first of all, companies that have below, say, a million dollars of EBITDA are really going to have a hard time finding somebody that can represent their business. And where brokers come in, is, is the network they've created of, of marketing your business. So it's gonna get you some attraction, might get you some opportunities, but I would agree with Bob, very often the due diligence isn't quite there. Um, the reliability of the information tends to, to, to be a little less, there's less depth to it. And so if you're buying a company that size or you're, you're that size and you're selling, you know, there's, there's a, I, I think there's a, a higher need for due diligence and, and, and um, uh, creating the support or, or having the support for the information that's being presented. I've seen many where, where they were off, off substantially. So, Well, I guess I, if I'm a business owner, I've hired an accountant, I've hired an attorney. I haven't hired a, uh, an investment banker. Is there a recommended process or how you would approach that, Bob, that you would go to, to hire someone in your, your own? Yeah, in, in my experience, it, it's, it really happens through an in, in introduction from an accountant or a lawyer or a wealth manager. I, I think what happens is that a business owner does have trusted advisors already. They have a trusted advisor or, or a trusted advisors. And it's usually comes from that, those categories or friends who sold their business. And so they make recommendations. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I would make sure you do your homework on, again, we touched on industry expertise, the, the people who work in certain size companies, um, understand your business, all those things are important. So make sure you find the right banker if you're going to do it. But it, oftentimes I, I, what I see is if, if, you, if you went through Tim or Jim, they've worked with everyone and probably in the, in, in, the, in the region, in the industry, they have partners who have as well. They will point you in the right direction of who might fit that particular company or, or maybe multiple um, people to interview. And I do think- yeah, I, I- I think if you've got a sophisticated advisor on board, whether it's a CPA, an investment banker, an attorney, they're going to have those relationships and connections where, you know, should you need to engage a further advisor, they're certainly going to be able to steer you in the right direction. Absolutely. Well, let's get this one on the table, which uh, comes from a lot of clients that I talk to. Uh, I'm going to throw this one at Tim to try to cover for everybody. Can you describe the typical fee structure for M&A services for all, all three of, of the panelists no, here? No, I cannot describe it <laughs> at all. Uh, well, I, here, here's what I think most people would experience. Um, from my perspective, from my practice, it's typically hourly rates where you're working on these projects. You might be able to give a client a range. Uh, one of the challenges you have is you never know how complex the deal is going to be. I've been involved where, where at the very end, we had to do what's called an F reorganization, where we had to get buyer and seller uh, agreeing to uh, a process of, of uh, a tax restructuring. So uh, there could be, could be uh, 10, 10 versions of a purchase agreement. There could be 100 versions. So I think from, from my perspective, from the CPA and what I've seen from the law firms is it tends to be hourly rates where I've seen our, my clients negotiating with, uh, with or hiring investment bankers, um, there's mul- there, I think there's a few components. Um, there might be some upfront or some skin money upfront, and very often it's a success fee. So there's some chart that you're going to be able to identify based on an expected enterprise value, and, and it might be an X plus a percent of X, and then as that goes up, it might might continue to change. But um, 
my experience with the investment bankers is everything's up front. You're going to see exactly what that chart is and you're going to know what the success fee is. From my perspective, the deals I've worked on with Jim and I, it always depends on the complexity of the transaction. Some are, are like, you know, knife through butter and, and some are the exact opposite. There's uh, contentious things or, or, or things that just, just continue on. So um, typically hourly rates uh, for, for what I would say the tax and accounting and legal professionals and, and a success fee uh, with the investment banker. Now that's on the sell side. I, I know investment bankers who represent buyers and they may have retainers that where, where they know strategically what they're searching for, for corporate clients. But, but on the sell side, I think that's pretty much what, what the listeners would expect. Jim or Bob, yeah, anything? Yep, go ahead, Jim. The, there's so many variables that, that go into uh, an M&A process, especially on the legal side, that it's, it, it's difficult to try and do some sort of fixed or flat fee. Um, you know, we, we've done so many of these deals. We, we generally have a range of, of where legal fees may come, although there's, there's normally a significant delta uh, between top and, and bottom, uh, bottom line price. Um, you know, again, it goes back to how sophisticated is counsel on the other side? Uh, what, what different aspects are in play? Are there environmental concerns? Is there a real estate component? Uh, do we have any governmental filings that are required? So, you know, there, there can be so many complexities that perhaps are not even foreseen at the beginning of the transaction. It's, it's often difficult uh, to, to, to give a, a good estimate. So, so generally speaking, we yeah. do take an hourly approach, but, you know, uh, certainly as an attorney, we're making sure that we're being candid and, and, and remember, you know, keeping the client informed as to, to what the legal spend looks like throughout the process. Yeah. And, and, you know, each one of those, each, each company's got their different circumstances. Jim and I worked on one that, that might come to fruition now. And the, the deal breaker three years ago was a pension liability. And it could be an international tax liability. It could be a multi-state tax liability. So some of those things, you know, the due diligence for, for the, the, both the buy side and the sell side can expand the need to bring in experts depending on the complexity of the entity. Bob, any final thoughts on uh, that you want to add to accounting? No, I would just say, listen, I mean, it, it, um, I, I tell clients this, it's going to scare you when you hear you're paying an accounting firm, you're paying an investment bank, you're paying law firms, you might be paying environmental firms. Throw them all in a, you know, throw them all in a pot in a bucket and say, hey, there might be two to 5% of the transaction. I'm just estimating depending on size of the transaction. I absolutely believe the value driver on the other side of that equation is going to dwarf the fees you're paying if you do this right. The, if you find the buyers and who's paying what, I mean, you're going to drive 10, 20% more value for your business by finding this better buyer, better outlier value. And I know I'm kind of self-promoting all, all of us, but I could tell you if I had my closest friends sitting across the table who owned a business and it was worth 20, 30, 40 million dollars, they would hear it from me. I mean, you're hiring a great group of advisors and you're going to pay them and get this done right. I mean, do not make that mistake. And so I, and I mean it and it's sincere. I've been doing this for you know, a long time, but it is a lot of money. I understand it. And I'm, I sympathize with business owners, but if you're doing this once and you get to one chance to do it right, it's worth everything. Yeah. A final thought on that, I guess, as a practitioner out there with my clients, uh, I don't see any, any uh, pushback on the fees on the back end because they, they, the value is proved throughout the transaction. So it's usually it's something that's bigger up front than it is on the middle or the back end. When you get done with it, it's, it's money well spent generally is what, what I, I've seen is my, my history and all the transactions that I've been involved and Jim, in. Jim, every deal I've ever done, I've, I've finished the deal and I said, I can't believe how hard it is to get a deal done every deal. And I've been doing this a long time. I'm like, it is hard to get deals. I mean, I mean, just hours of hardness and not even all the smarts and the intricacies. It's, it takes a ton of time and effort to get deals done. And it's hard to explain it to a business owner who hasn't gone through it. Uh, Jim and Tim both know it. I mean, they've been through it. So. Uh, is there a lead advisor through the whole transaction? And one of you guys take the lead the whole way, or is it interplay from strategy all the way through close and post close how, how, do, how does that work anyone want to jump in on that yeah I, I mean i think within each individual firm you might have a, a lead individual um who perhaps is interfacing with the client more so than not but i think 
the transaction as a whole, I would say no. I, I mean, I'm certainly uh, more inclined to take a team approach. Um, you know, I, I look at it as though we all have to be uh, in the huddle uh, and know what the, what the play call is, right? Because um, if, if I'm having discussions and, and I'm not keeping Tim in the loop or I'm not keeping Bob in the loop, uh, something may get lost. So I think, I think to the extent that efforts are coordinated uh, and, and all of the teams are, are involved in the process, because really there is so much interplay. Uh, it's not, you know, we, we get to the, the transaction documents, it's not just legal concepts, right? It's, there are, you know, financial components that, for example, Tim's going to need to review and opine on. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's necessarily a, le a lead person relative to the transaction as a whole. Uh, I think it's more team approached. If, if I was going to use the, the, the sports analogy, Jim said the huddle, I would say somebody like Bob to me is the offensive coordinator. There's very often a lot of coordination that the investment banker is doing with the data book, um, making sure the deal flows and making sure things flow from both sides. So um, I, I, I feel like uh, more often than not, the investment banker is more the quarterback I'm uh, sorry, the, the, um, the, the offensive coordinator making sure, hey, Jim, do you got everything you need? Tim, do you got everything you need? And very often it, it is keeping the client and potentially the, the, the prospective buyer in the loop on things. So there is some coordination there. Um, you know, a lot of times Jim and I, are, with our team, are, we're, we're, in, we're in that huddle because we are looking at the specific issues that affect our clients. So. We're running out of time, so I'm going to throw one last question for the last couple of minutes here. Uh, when should a business owner start to assemble a team? I, you know, if I, I obviously, if somebody's it's tapping easy. me on the shoulder versus maybe two years from now, when when do you start this process? Yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. Yeah, two years ago. I mean, I think if if there's any interest or inclination that you're looking to sell, I would start building your team right away. Because again, you want to make sure you've got you've got your house in order and that you're ready for a transaction process. And the sooner you can get your your advisors involved, the better off you're going to be once you're ready to take the business to market. It's it's it, I can just tell you, even a, a year or two in advance, there's so much that business owners leave on the table and it's too late to change it because they haven't planned accordingly. And so it's all about you know, maximizing value after tax dollars. And you can do a lot of structuring from a tax perspective, as well as preparing your company operationally to manage this process. It takes, it takes some time prior to an actual transaction occurring. So and at least one or two years, you would like to be thinking about this and preparing. I, I think the one thing that is so overlooked that when you start saying, hey, I got I to gotta meet a Jim, I got to meet a Bob, is... Entrepreneurs very often ignore the balance sheet and the balance sheet sometimes really can mess up a deal where they think they're going to get something. They don't realize how their leverage affects it. Uh, excess working capital. There's just so many things that I'm sure Bob has seen where a balance sheet was not ready to be sold. You just, you know, the, the EBITDA is there, but the balance sheet isn't going to get the owner what they need and they got to plan for that. That takes time. So there's a little backfill is what you're saying. You, you, you just, if you, you can do cleanup if, if somebody's tapping you on your shoulder, you're doing a deal right away, but it's better to be a year or a year and a half ahead of time to get some cleanup done so you're ready to go. Everything's in order. And if somebody does tap you on the shoulder, when you have Bob or Jim or let's say myself, make sure get guys who have a big stick, you know, who are you tap me on the shoulder. I'm not for sale, but I got excess working capital. I got this. I got that. They'll they'll carry the big stick for you. All right, I think that's the end of our questions. And Delaney, hopefully you're still out there somewhere. We're at 11.59, so at least on my clock, 12 o'clock. So I think it's time to take over uh, yeah. from your standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a fantastic, really enlightening discussion. And, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, Jim Beal, Tim Hillegas, Bob Corey, and Jim Wagoner. This, you know, this is an all-star team of professionals, and we're so grateful for you to share your experience and your insights with us. And to all of our participants today, we encourage you to reach out to any one of us with your thoughts, questions, or just to chat and brainstorm if you're considering a, a transaction, if you're in the middle of it, um, if you're wondering maybe where are some ways that, that you could have improved it or um, any of those items. This, this is really great opportunity with this team of professionals here. Um, an upcoming item that may be of interest to our participants is this series of reasonable suspicion drug and alcohol abuse training sessions that MMA is hosting across the state in June. 
Um, it's no secret that drug use and abuse continues to be a deeply concerning matter for manufacturers. And it's, it's really important that you protect your company and ensure that your frontline leaders are properly trained. So you can find out more about that at mimfg.org. Um, and as Jim mentioned earlier, we look forward to seeing you at session three, which will take a deeper dive on the due diligence process on June 10th. And on uh, session four of this series, which we'll talk about the back end of the deal, and that's on June 24th. Um, so if you weren't able to make it for session one, as Jim mentioned earlier, um, a recording of that session is available on demand, both at mimfg.org and claytonmccurvey.com. So with that, uh, we thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all soon.